And so here we see our story picking up in the fact that God comes, he says to his disciples, hey, I want you to go and wait. I got this special gift that I want to give to you, this helper. Why would we need a helper? We need help. We need help. Okay. And so you're going to get this helper. And so then he tells them about it. And then he ascends to heaven and they're all going. And all of a sudden an angel shows up and says, what are you doing? Yes, he went up, but he said he's coming back. So go. Go do what he told you to do. And it says there in the last part of verse 12, and they went into Jerusalem. So now we pick up at verse 13, and it says, and when they had entered, entered what? Jerusalem. They went up to the what? The upper room where they had been staying. And that is, who was he speaking about here? That is Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. Now, those of you that went to private school, how many guys are listed there? How many are listed? I mean, uh, they don't teach academics in the public school. Yeah, okay, so what is it? How many are listed there? Eleven. eleven. Okay, now we're going to see that it's not only eleven that are there, but specifically we're told there are eleven. Now, how many apostles, disciples were there? Twelve. twelve. And so the Bible starts off right here specifically listing this post-Easter story that we're looking at next week. This post-Easter story, there are now eleven of these apostles and so he lists them now where are they he says they're in the upper room now we as Christians post Easter Christians we have very spiritualized the upper room there's ministries called the upper room ministry and all these different types of things yes it is something that something beautiful happened but let me know that I want to let you know that it first starts out very practical like a lot of things in Christianity that we've spiritualized but in reality it's just practical remember I tell you the reason why candles were used in church was not for holiness it's because they didn't have a light switch <laughs> So everyone that came in brought a candle. That was the whole purpose. The incense, why? Because people stunk. <laughs> they bathed once a year in the 1600s in a stone church with the building windows at the top. Oh, way no hey. So that's why they brought in the incense. And so for the same thing, why were folks in the upper rooms? Not because of a higher altitude, no. It was the largest room in any house was the upstairs. Why? Because any of you guys know, you have to have the load-carrying beams here that hold this big thing together so we can have the space. And so the downstairs had all the small rooms in order to carry the load of the beams to go across. And so everyone would have their grand room, no walls, in the upstairs. Why? Because upstairs is where the air is. It's where the air is. Remember, Jerusalem's in the middle of a desert. desert. Deserts get very cold and they get very hot. And they could not just turn on their little Mitsubishi and go, dit, 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 dit. no, they couldn't do that. But we see this reference of what was going on and why it was going on was in this upper room. My point, sometimes we worship things as the elements that maybe not necessarily need to be things that we worship. Let's commemorate and let's celebrate, but let's not get lost in the minors. Amen? Amen? Okay, so we recognize it's not about candles or this or that and so on and so forth. It's the purpose of the event. Now, what does it say about these 11 and the others that were with them? Verse 14, these all with, what does it say? One mind. Some of your version says one accord. What that really means, what do you mean by one mind? Just write over it, same passion. That's my best translation for you of that Greek word. They were of the same passion, you know, one heart, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. They were of the same passion, these all with one mind. And how do we know, or what was the byproduct of them being of one mind? It says they were, the next word in my, in my Bible says continually. Do you have that? They were continually, and then the next word is devoted. Okay, continually and devoted. Now, underline or note that in your Bible because that doesn't say spontaneously. It doesn't say weekly. It says they were continually, and they were continually what? Devoted, and what does it say? To? I think there was no recession on intercession. They were continually devoted to prayer, not just the first Sunday of the month, not just for the first 15 minutes of the day. There was this unity 
of one accord that they had. And then it goes on to say this, that they were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And then it says, along with, so we've got these 11 first mentioned, and then it says, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, those three last groups are listed for a reason, and I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. But ladies, first and foremost, I want you to understand, I went through school and I heard professors and people saying that the Bible is a bigoted book. It is, it is, a, it, it is a male-dominated book. God himself is even called he and all this other kinds of stuff. Family, that is the greatest bunch of nonsense you can possibly have because there is no single literature of the first century era that gives more honor to women than the Bible. Amen. You're going to see next week that the very people group that God chose to reveal himself first and foremost to was what? The women. They were the first to find the discovery. And so he wants us to know that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but all one in Christ Jesus. And so in this very patristic society, he wants them to know that, oh yeah, the apostles were there and the ladies. This wasn't some boys club. No. My disciples were there. And then he goes on even to include his family, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But what did they have? Write this down in your notes. Right now in verse 14, this very first introduction, what did they have? What they did have was this, unity, prayerfulness, and expectancy. They had unity. They had prayerfulness, and as we're going to see in the text, they had expectancy. You see, this all goes together. Jot this down if you would in your notes. Prayer produces unity, and unity empowers prayer. Prayer produces unity, and unity empowers prayer. You see, folks, you cannot manufacture unity. You can't. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. You can have plans. You can have programs. You can have events. But true kononia, true unity, this is called kononia hale. That's why they call it K-house here. Kononia hale or K-hale. True kononia is only a work of the Holy Spirit. Ironically now, God says love one another and he commands us. But what if I said, you know, love me, love me, love me. You're like, psycho. <laughs> Okay, it, it's a byproduct of something that happens by God. And you see, here is the thing. We see it right here is the quote-unquote uh, formula, if you want to call it that. Prayer produces unity, and then unity begins to empower prayer. Let me tell you what I mean. Nothing tears down barriers like prayer. When I first went to Molokai, Long blonde hair down to here, had my Harley, hair pulled back, surfer. I mean, starting a church, those guys were convinced I was the new cult leader. <laughs> the pastors there were like, oh yeah, those guys are going to drink the Kool-Aid real soon, you know, <laughs> for sure. And so I invited all of the kahus to come and let's gather together to pray. And I think some of them came just to make sure and to check me out because they wanted to make sure no one's getting deceived by this new freaked out hippie Harley. And so they begin to come because I know there's one thing that bonds us together, it's prayer. If you've ever done the God's Ohana Day and we get together and you've got churches of extreme Pentecostal expression, church of extreme conservative expression, and they come together and all of a sudden there is no distinction. There is neither Jew nor Greek, Lutheran nor Presbyterian, but we're all one in Christ Jesus because we're praying. And so I get together and I start praying with these guys. And at first we were doing very pastoral prayers. <laughs> Lord, we pray for a Molokai high school. We pray for the drugs on the campus, and we pray that there would be a move of God. But Lord, we thank you for that. Thing. And Father, we thank you for this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so the first week, it was very pastoral. <laughs> and we prayed. The second week, same guys came back. Miracle number one. <laughs> And we started praying, and all of a sudden the Lord just said, Brother, would you talk to me? And as I'm praying, and I just said, Lord, you know in this last week I felt really wronged. And I'm having a real hard time loving that person like you called me to as a shepherd and as a Christian. 
And so, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to give me the grace to humble myself this week. And there was silence. And there was silence. And there was silence. Now, all of a sudden, one of the other pastors, the loudest opponent of me being there, the one who has told all of his congregation about this new guy to watch out for and sheep stealer and all this stuff, total let out of fear. Two prayer times. All of a sudden, he's like, Lord, you know, this week, I didn't treat my wife the way you've called me to treat her. And I just ask for your forgiveness and give me the strength to go home and ask for her forgiveness. And then the next pastor, and then the next, and the next. And we ceased to be pastors, and we became sinners saved by grace. Prayer produces unity. Some of you, your families aren't even getting along. You need to get together and pray. And not, Lord, help them not be stupid prayer. That's not the prayer I'm talking about. <laughs> It's, Lord, let's get together and let's pray for our community. Lord, let's pray for what's going on. And let's pray, God, fix me, not fix them. Amen. And the prayer produces unity. But the coolest thing is then unity, it begins to empower prayer. And then as we gather together as the body of Christ, and we can pray for Hawaii name, we can pray for the change. And that is what they had. They had this expectancy because they had unity. And why? Because they were in one accord. That doesn't mean they were driving a Honda. <laughs> Okay? That means that their same passion because of the same boss was who they were talking to. And notice this unity. These 11 individuals, originally 12, were extremely different individuals that would have never hung out with each other if it wasn't for Jesus. Amen. Like, look around. Amen. Some of you surf. Some of you don't. I'm glad you don't because there's too many people in the water already. <laughs> Some of you play golf. I'm not sure why, but you do. <laughs> but blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. See, my point is, is, is that when you have the Spirit of God upon you, you cease to look at and you begin to look in. Jesus never met a hooker. What? What about da, 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 da? No. You see, a hooker was what she did, and that's what the Pharisees saw. Jesus saw a woman strapped in sin, desperately needing healing, forgiveness, love, and acceptance. Amen. And you see, I find it kind of crazy that today I'm pastoring in a world where one of the big things that they're talking about in the church is celebrating diversity in the church. And so the big front page of the thing is right here is portrait of a diverse church. And so this guy is like selling all kinds of books and having all this stuff about how to have a diverse church. Well, for crying out loud, look around. Do you see one particular ethnicity in this room? Do you see a particular age? No, you got a granny with sewing needles right next to people who got more pukas in their body within all over their entire... <laughs> got metal everywhere. They're a nightmare to go through an airport. <laughs> you know why? Because we haven't worked out in saying, how can I get more uh, African-American? How can I get more... I don't have to worry about Portuguese. They're already here. But how can I get, you know, more <laughs> other people to... <laughs> no. You teach the Word of God, and when you have the Word of God, you hunger and thirst for Him. And if God is your Father, I'm your brother, deal with it. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yes. That's how God's way works. We don't have to be, quote, so intentional about things if we begin to walk according to God and let His Holy Spirit take rule and reign our lives. But you know what our problem is? I'll tell you what it is. I found this this week. I almost fell out of my chair. I have one of those rolling chairs in my office, and I almost fell when I read this from a commentator that I often use in my sermons. So this is a commentator that I use that I have respect for, and this is what he says, and I quote, the disciples, when they went into the upper room and waiting for the Holy Spirit, they were following the instructions suggested by Jesus, and he cross-references in Luke eleven thirteen. 13. However, since the day of Pentecost, it is not necessary for Christians to pray for the Holy Spirit. 
okay? This is their mindset. This is what's going on in our seminaries, in our churches, and the things that people get. And then this is his cross-reference there in Romans 8, 9. See, he goes, this is why I mean this. He says this, however, you are not, as a New Testament Christian, he's saying, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, folks, we've been learning. This is about regeneration. We've learned that the Spirit of God is in three ways in the Bible very clearly. He is with us, para. He is in us, E-N, and us, and he is upon us. Now, let's look at the verse. What does the verse say? Clear as a bell. Notice it says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So, yes, if God is not in you, you are not born again. But if you are born again, you also have an incredible gift, and that is the Spirit of God upon you. Right. Amen? Amen? But you see, we're walking around with impotence. A.W. Tozer, as most of you know, one of my favorite disciples, says this. It is one thing, says Henry Suso, to fear for one, excuse me, to hear for oneself the sweet lute, sweetly played, and quite another thing merely to hear about it. And it is one thing, we may add, to hear truth inward for one's very self, and quite another thing merely to hear about it. We are turning out from the Bible schools of this country year after year, young men and women who practice the theory of a spirit-filled life, but do not enjoy the experience. These go out into churches and create, in turn, a generation of Christians who have never felt the power power of the Spirit, and who know nothing personally about inner fire, the next generation will even drop the theory. That is exactly the course some groups have taken over the past years. One word from the lips of someone who has actually heard the lute play will have more effect than scores of sermons by those who have only heard that it was played. Acquaintance is always better than hearsay. Amen. Folks, have you just heard about this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Have you just kind of argued it away theologically because it's never really happened to you? Have you given some excuse of one reason or a certain epoch or season or whatever? Do you know what it means to be saved by grace and empowered by the Holy Spirit that all of a sudden you have things that you did not have before, a power to forgive someone because you couldn't do it on your own and now you just love them and you don't even know how and even your wife says, how can you? And you're like, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit has just said, it's Pono and I'm good. And he begins to walk and begin to heal us in our lives. You see, this is what it means to be spirit-filled, spirit-upon, spirit-used Christians. And I think we know too much, but we don't live as much. I want you to see something that's very important in this text. I want you to see a side note here. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, last, the last part I told you, there's three groups that are mentioned. First, I mentioned the women, but then it says Mary, the mama of Jesus, because there's so many Marys, and so Mary, his mother, and then it says his brothers. First of all, note with me, please, everyone. I spoke about unity, unity in one accord, unity when we pray, but I also need to make sure that you understand that we need to be scripturally clear. And if you will see this, Mary, notice, is listed as one of the worshipers, not someone who's being worshipped. See that there. She is one of the worshipers. See, Mary is not a co-redeemer with us, and Jesus never led to that. In fact, even in Matthew 12, when someone said, hey, your mother and father, he says, who, who is my mother? Who, who are my brothers? He says, my father is my father in heaven. But one of my favorite things to remind people is Mary herself in the whatevers. Remember at the, at the wedding of Cana? They needed the miracle, and she says to them, hey, whatever he says do. She didn't say, come to me and I'll tell you what he says. She takes them directly to Jesus and says, ask him directly and answer him directly and obey him directly. 
Amen? Amen? But on the flip side of the coin, too many in the Protestant movement have just demeaned Mary and tried to, no, 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 no. Mary is to be the most revered of all women. She is the blessed of all women. She of all times and all seasons, God chose to dwell within her to bring forth Amen. the Messiah. My point, Mary is to be honored but not worshiped. Amen. Know the difference. Know the difference. And so the Bible is listing not only the women, not only his mama being there worshiping, but also his brothers. Now, why is that so crazy? The Gospels make it very clear that when he was beginning to teach in the Bible, in the, in the New Testament, they thought he was cuckoo. They went to go get him and bring him home. Okay? We knew you were always Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, bro. But now you think you're the Messiah? Okay, let's come home before you shame the family. And yet these very same brothers are the very same brothers who are here worshiping him, the very same brother who writes the book of James, the very same brother who writes the book of Jude, and they all claim Jesus as being God. What could take them from thinking he's cuckoo to worshiping him as God? Resurrection. Resurrection. Only the resurrection. Let me put it another way. Raise your hand if any of your siblings will write a book that you're God. Okay, you know, not at all. In fact, if there's anybody that knows our Pilakia, it is our family, correct? They're the ones that know everything that's in our lives and every shortcoming. But for them to worship him, oh, that is a powerful, powerful testimony. And so they've gathered together in this room, all these individuals, in verse 15, and it says, And at this time, Peter stood up. Now, I would encourage you to underline this because it's, again, a powerful idiom that we need to understand in Jewish culture. But then Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. And now notice, a gathering of about 11 people. Is that who were there? How many? Okay, about 120 persons were there together. Now, why is that important that we notice? Because remember, in, the, in this culture, in this time, you would stand up to proclaim, you sit down to teach. So me right now with my post-knee surgeries, I'm actually very apropos that I'm sitting down mostly while I'm teaching because that's what a rabbi would do. But when he needed to proclaim, so pay attention when you read to the book of Acts and we read the Gospels and it would say, and James stood up and Peter stood up and Jesus sat down. You can understand what is to come. So he stands up and he's going to make a proclamation. What is his proclamation? Verse 16, brethren. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his portion in this ministry. Hey, he says here that the word of God was fulfilled in Judas because he foretold what would happen to Jesus by one of his own. He was with us and he betrayed us. So what did they have? Verse 14 tells me what they did have was they had unity. They had prayer. They had expectancy. Verse 16, what does it tell us? What they didn't have? They didn't have their 12th. You can jot that down. They didn't have their 12th person, their 12th player. 12 was a very important number within Judaism and within numerology, but even more so if it wasn't just Jesus' own words would have been ringing in their ear, what it says in Matthew 19. Take a look overhead. It says, and Jesus said to them. How do I know Jesus said this? Because it says Jesus said it, okay? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit upon... 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they recognize they don't have their 12th player. Now, why is he so fervent about this? Well, take a look. What is Peter's view of Scripture? What does it say? Brethren, the Scripture had to be fulfilled because God says what he means and he means what he says. He says, which the Holy Spirit foretold. Now underline that. What does this tell me that Peter believed about the Old Testament? What does he think God's word is? God's word. Boy, wasn't that deep. God's word is nothing short of God's word. It might be helpful for you to write that down. 
You might be thinking, well, no, Pastor, that, that, that's, that's an obvious. Is it really? Because, you see, Peter believed that God's word was not to be altered in any sense of any word. It had to happen because it's God-breathed. The word inspired literally means God-breathed. This is God's word. And yet somehow I live in a culture that seems to take God's word and figure out that we can tweak it a little bit because that's not really, we know when he says work six days, but you can rest on, uh, you know, rest on what you can rest or, or, you know, Jesus is my rest and he's my sabbatical rest. And, and that's really what I mean. We start taking God's word and start, well, you know, it doesn't necessarily, and all of a sudden our culture has tried to have an impact on the scriptures rather than our scriptures having an impact on our culture. Because we do not believe that God's word is God's word and that it's inspired. Peter believed it so much. And so did Paul, Rabbi Paul, who studied under Gamaliel in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says this to Timothy. He says, how much scripture? All scripture is inspired. That part about fornication, you know, yeah, well, we're going to get married anyways, and God knows our heart, so he knows that we love, really? All scripture is inspired by God, duh, for profitable, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why, why do we need these things? Verse 17, that the person of God, that's the anthropos, so it's not just male, that the people of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It is the word of God by the spirit of God that makes you and I adequate, equipped, and ready to serve. Amen. And so do we treat it as God's holy word or do we kind of pick and choose like a salad bar what we want to obey? You see, Peter was certain that this prophecy needed to be fulfilled. Let me show you Peter's idea of prophecy. It tells me this in 2 Peter 1. He says this, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God hey the same thing Old Testament there spoken God breathed and so when God says it I believe it that settles it says Peter and so it must happen because this is what God said so he sees this and believes that the prophecies of God are God's to keep so in Psalms in Zechariah they're now recognizing the very things that were spoken about Judas were prophesied 30 pieces of silver like it said in Zechariah and it's exactly what he betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver what about Psalm 41 where it says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Now, many of you who have come to our Good Friday uh, Easter vigil services in the past where I was able to show you all the elements of the triconium table and what it was in the fulfillment of Jesus. And we will look at that again this Friday. But remember, when it comes to who they were seating and how the seating chart went, the person who dipped his bread, who dipped his sup together, the one who was seated in the seat of honor was none other than Judas. Judas, Jesus gave him the ultimate love, the ultimate opportunity, even knowing who he was and what he was going to do, God gave him every opportunity to change his heart. And yet the scripture says, yeah, the one in whom I ate bread with, he's the one that discipled me. What's my point? Well, if everything about Jesus' first coming was literal, then what should I be looking for about his second coming? Literal. So I'm not telling you to weigh yourself down by watching hours and hours and hours of news, but at the same time, don't be clueless to what's going on in the Middle East. Don't be clueless what's going on to Russia right now and the leadership and the power plays and the things that are happening and pulling out of Syria and these different things. Folks, these things that are going on in the news, they shouldn't bring fear. They should bring incitement to your life. Know that this is right on schedule with the way God said the world was going to be when God was ready to come back for his people. Look for it. Now, if what I've just said is true, that God knew everything about Judas, then I need to respond to a question that I used to have professors throw at me. 
They would say, you believe God is sovereign? Yes. And so you believe God knows everything? Yes. So he's omnipresent? Yes. So he's omnipresence? Yes. So he's everywhere. He knows everything. He's all authority, large and in charge. Well, then that means that God picked Judas knowing what Jesus, Judas would do. Therefore, he set Judas up. Thus, your God is an author of evil. <laughs> And I've heard many Christian students being given this by professors, and they kind of go, uh, uh, uh. Most of you in this room know that that is the stupidest statement on the planet because I've already taught you what sovereignty means. Sovereignty and omniscience means that you know. But just because you know doesn't mean you manipulate. Case in point, church is done. There's a table right here. There is one piece of pizza, and there's one bowl of poke. Which one am I going to eat? Poke. poke. Now, did you make me do that? No, you knew I would do that, but you did not make me do that. In the same way, this predetermined, predestined, yes. Does God know who's going to go to heaven, who's going to go to hell? Yes, but he doesn't make you. You choose, but because he's sovereign, he knows. Well, then why does he even let them live if he knows they're going to go to hell? Because then God is Adolf Hitler, and he's only allowing those to play who are going to play by his rules. So which is it? You got him either as a manipulator or a, a God of love. Which is it? You can't have it both ways. See, we try to fit God into our framework and in our mind. And so here he is saying, listen, I knew what Judas was going to do, but I gave him every opportunity to not. And that is why they say about him in verse 18, now this man, this Judas, he, a field was acquired with the price of his wickedness. That 30 pieces of silver we know was bought to buy a field to put his body in. And falling headlong down, he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. This is when all the junior hires go, yeah. It's good and gross, yeah. Fall down, yeah. I did years of youth ministry. Well, first of all, let's talk about this. We know in the Bible that this is reference to a potter's field. What is a potter's field? It's spoken about in Zechariah, that that's where he would end up. It's spoken about in Matthew, about a potter's field. But some of you have watched a whole lot of It's a Wonderful Life, and we're not talking about that potter, okay? A potter's field was literally this. Listen to me. When a potter would work, usually in his home, because everyone would have their business down below and living in their upstairs, he would make his objects, but when an object would become marred, it ended up being broken in the kiln, it didn't come out the way it was supposed to, or it became hardened and no longer pliable, the potter would just take it and chuck it right out the window and throw it out, and that became known as a potter's field, because what would happen is that this place of unmoldable, broken, marred creations that were no longer of any purpose ended up, even the ground itself would become marred and it was good for nothing but a burial ground. Because you couldn't plant anything there because of all the pot shares that were there, and, and you couldn't uh, build anything out there because the structure itself, you would never have any adhesion, and so they would use these places for cemeteries. Now listen to what I just said, if that's not going to preach about where broken, cracked pots, no longer things that are able to be moldable and pliable, ended up. And this is where Judas ends up. Now, it's important to pay attention when you're on the ground because what I'm telling you right now is still very relevant. Every single year when I take people, and if you go with me in September, same thing. I always take you there, and the first day I say, hey, all of the freebie gifts and the best freebie gifts you have for your friends back home are right on the ground. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. You see all of that little red in there? Yeah. Those are first century pots. You're picking up things that we think are in a museum. It's so all over Israel, you're going to be able to find it. And I'd be able to look at the side of that grain, and I'll tell you when, what year, because of how the clay was. And we can tell you whether it's first, second, third, pre-BC, and you can see the fingerprints and everything else. And so I always tell everybody, pay attention. And I notice those who do, because they come back with their pockets like this, <laughs> find handles and everything else like that. But I'll tell you what, a lady last week, she was taking her walk in Israel, and she looked down, and she didn't find a pot shared. She found this. One of ten made by one emperor honoring another emperor, only two known to exist, the one in the museum in London and this one. Millions upon millions upon millions of dollars this coin is worth. But the point is, the very process is still relevant today. And so Judas ends up in a potter's field. 
Jot this down. This is important for us, and I'll explain it. Judas prejudged Jesus. A lot of times people ask me, how, how, how could Judas do this? He, he saw the miracles. He saw, he was with the other 11. How and why would he betray? It says, you know, Satan filled his heart, but with what? How, how could he betray Jesus? We see G Judas prejudged Jesus, because what do we know about Judas? He was Simon the, the zealot, okay? Judas, this zealot. And so what is a zealot? It's someone who was politically new, that there needed to be a change politically. And so when he thought of Messiah, he thought someone who would deliver them from Rome. Oh, seemingly how small our plans are versus God. Say, so you don't need to be delivered from Rome. You need to be delivered from yourself. Amen. You need to be saved from sin and death and hell. And so all of a sudden, when he sees Jesus speaking kindly about the centurions and speaking negatively about the religious leaders and their hypocrisy, he starts to think, wait a minute, this Messiah is not acting as I think a Messiah should be. Is that making sense, Christians? And so all of a sudden, he begins to prejudge and say, maybe I made a Messiah mistake. Maybe he is not the one who I should put my faith in. And so he prejudges Jesus. And then once he does so, and then recognizes in his heart that he put to death an innocent man, then he prejudged himself. Write that down. He prejudged Jesus, which then led it very easy for to him prejudge himself. I am unworthy to live. What I've done is unforgivable. It tells us in the scriptures in verse 18 that after he killed himself that his body fell headlong down and his guts and everything exploded and blew open. Well, you're going to find people who come up to you and say, oh, there's another contradiction on your Bible. You got two different deaths for Judas. Matthew says that he hung himself, and here it says he went over a cliff and his guts broke out. Which is it? And the answer is yes. yes. Okay? There was no table and chair for him to kick off. If you know where Caiaphas' house is, if you've been there, it's on a cliff as it goes down along the side of a house. The brother recognizes the guilt of what he's done, finds whatever is around him to make as a rope, throws it over a branch, and throws himself off over a cliff. He dies, and as he dies, his body becomes bloated, and as the body becomes bloated, either the birds come and start eating and pluck away that the, the branch breaks or the rope breaks or somebody cut it, but nonetheless, it falls down, boom, splat. My point? Folks, do not let people argue with you out of an argument of silence. Meaning, when the scripture is giving detail, it's giving detail on a specific thing, and that's all it's giving detail about. If you are looking at that poster right now, you do not know what it says on the clock on that back wall. And please don't look. Okay? If you're looking that way, does that mean the clock doesn't exist? No. Does it mean the palms back there don't exist? No. So why do people come up to me and say, where did Cain get his wife? Um, did you not read in the story how long they were living there? Six, seven, eight hundred years? Why do you seem to think that the only people who were alive by the time Cain killed Abel were just those four players? Obviously not, because even Cain's afraid of the people who are going to retaliate against them. There's already communities and civilizations. We've got hundreds of years. But God is looking and telling you one story about the lineage of God so that you would know, you and I would know there's a Savior. Amen? Amen. <sighs> it's a good thing I don't go to universities anymore because I'd get arrested. <laughs> trying to toy with young people's minds. Folks, it says here about Judas, verse 19, and it became known to all. Everybody knew what he did. It became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language, the field is called hakel dema, or hakel dema, depending on the version you have written, which means field of blood. This traitor, God bless you, field of blood. Now, why am I making this point? Because there's not a one of us in this room who have not betrayed Jesus in one way. We have not, not one of us who have not let him down, that we made a promise and we didn't keep it, that Jesus did not meet our expectations and so we got all haboot and did whatever. And you see, God is trying for us to understand that the blood of Jesus, what he shed on the cross, was just for that purpose. He didn't die on the cross because we're good. He died on the cross because we need a savior. Amen? 
That's the whole point. You see, God takes useless vessels, marred creations, things that have become hardened and aren't pliable anymore, and he says, my love, my blood will change. It will change you. Take a look at this. Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord. And you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. Hey. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it, all right? Okay. Good. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb and the tomb was empty and she said that the, there was an angel there and the angel said go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay he is risen and so me and John we hightailed it down there and if John says he beat me he's totally lying all right I beat him FYI all right you know and we get down there and I'm looking in that tomb and it is it is empty there's nothing in there you know what I'm saying and I'm like what does this mean what does this mean and John is right there John is so good with words he should write a book he is so good with words and John said don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is okay. said what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable for no, what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. That's grace. Hallelujah. See, two men radically betrayed him that night. But let's look at the difference. Both believed what they did was unforgivable. So Judas went out and hung himself. And Peter hung around long enough to hear himself forgiven. Which are you? Which are you? You see, stick around. Let God love you. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There is nothing you can do to make God love you less. He loves you. And so the story is to let us know this contrast between Judas and what he did by prejudging Jesus and prejudging himself and Peter, who in his shame was able to be around his family, his disciples, his brothers, that he would hear the forgiveness of God. It's powerful for you and I to see.
For Peter himself preaches about this Judas. He says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no man dwell in it. And his office, let another man take. He's saying, look, look at God's word. It is to be fulfilled. And we've seen it happen here and it did and happen here and it did. And so now he comes to this place and he starts saying what it said in Psalm 69 and 109. Both of these have taken place. And so for this reason, Peter now says, verse 21, it is there. Therefore, necessary. Now, what did I tell you that they did have? Prayer, unity, expectancy. What didn't they have? Their 12th. They didn't have their 12th. It is now, he's talking about Judas, the distinction between what happened to me and what happened to Judas. And so he now says, it is therefore necessary that one of the men who have accompanied us all of the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with, verse 22, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness, should become our 12th man, our 12th player of his resurrection. And they looked basically at the list of these parameters and they came up with two. And they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Now, Peter, listen to me, Christian. Peter, being led by a conviction that God's word is powerful begins to plan out the fulfillment of God's Word. Because God's Word is God's Word, and so we must do something about God's Word. God says, hey, you're going to have a child. Hey, it's been 10 years, honey. We still haven't got a child. Well, you know what? Maybe it's supposed to be through my servant, Hagar. You know, and it would still be your child because you're Abraham. And, and so, you know, it's the household. That's what he's meaning is household, not literally you and I. And so we have an, a, an Ishmael. And there's not a one of us in this room that hasn't been raising an Ishmael in our lives because we try to figure out and manipulate God's word, will, and way to fit our understanding. You see, folks, what was the last thing Jesus told these disciples to do? Go into the upper room and wait. wait. And yet they're in the upper room and they're planning. Planning. Where did they get these parameters? Where in the Bible does it say, a disciple is someone who was supposed to be there from the baptism of John all the way through to this point? You see, all of a sudden, when you and I start putting parameters upon God, we get limited vision and we get limited options. And we do it all the time. Folks, we begin to plan things according to our understanding. Write this down. Zeal plus common sense does not equal God's will. And yet we constantly set these credentials. Family, I'm going to tell you right now, the Lord has options that we've never seen or heard of. What looks like a trap. There is an army in front of me. There's a mountain on the left, a mountain on the right, and a sea behind me. We're doomed. No, it wasn't doom. It was opportunity for God to shine. And God parted those sea, and the people went through. You see, what we need to understand is this. It says right here in verse 20, And they prayed and said, Thou, O Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men. Doesn't that sound very spiritual? Thou, O Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men. Show us which one of what? These two you've chosen. So, Lord, am I supposed to marry him or him? Lord, is it Florida or California? Where do you want us to move? Lord, what is it you wanted me to do this or do you want me to do that? Family, why do we begin to manipulate and put parameters upon God? Lord, this is the car that I believe, so can you help me with the finances? Rather than saying, God, do you even want me to have a car? And do you want to give me one? Have you ever waited for the miracle? Like Daniel said, hey, let's eat our own food for seven days and see what happens. Let's give a miracle room. And let's watch God work. No, we start putting on parameters. Can I tell you right now in love, don't give God options. Give him your heart. Amen. 
and let God rock your world. See, when we limit God, then we sound like Peter here who says in verse 24, God, show us which one of these two thou hast chosen, verse 25, to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside and to go to his own place. Meaning Judas left this calling and so, Lord, we need the 12th man. So which one of these two, verse 26, and they drew lots for them from these two guys, Matthias and, 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 uh, and Joseph, excuse me, and then he says, which one of these two? And then he goes on to say this, and they drew lots, and the number came to who? Matthias. Hmm. First thing someone's asking me is, is there gambling in the Bible? Is the Bible validating Vegas? No. Casting lots was a very common practice up until this time. What they believed that God was so sovereign that he could even manipulate God so large and in charge that when they needed a discernment on certain things throughout the times of the Old Testament, they would write the names of the different options and they believed that God would direct even through that. Well, actually, where do you get that? Well, the Bible, Proverbs 16:33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And so this was a process that they did. But this is what I love, Christian, and don't miss this. This is the last time in the Bible we hear the mentioning of lots. Why? Because God has just given them the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of discernment. So now you and I don't have to cast lots. We don't have to throw out fleece. We can say, Lord, write your will upon my heart. Because no longer are you with me, no longer are you just upon me, but now you are in me. And this is the beautiful thing. Now they were needing their 12th. Well, yeah, because the Bible said there was the 12 thrones. But folks, let's let God be God because God's not his name, it's his job, his job description. And I believe with all of my heart that the 12th man was none other than Paul. Amen. Why would I say that? Well, what do we know about Matthias after this point? Nothing. Nothing. Paul writes three quarters of the books of the New Testament. Paul, who was seen raising people from the dead through the anointing and the power of Jesus Christ. And oh, by the way, in little Peter's descriptions here, that he needed to see the resurrected Jesus. Well, he did. It was on a road called Damascus. And on the Damascus road, there he is. And God shows up and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he also talks about this, the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 and so forth, where he's brought before the presence of God. But Peter himself, the very Peter who says, this is what God's word is, and tries to, to figure out a way to make it work, he himself through the years now sees the anointing of Paul, and these are his own words. Look overhead. You maybe have not paid attention to this. 2 Peter 3.15, and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved brother... Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, not just the one, but Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, all his letters, speaking in them of the things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, we still see that, as they do the what? The rest of the what? Scriptures. This same Peter who says that God breathed the Holy Spirit, the scriptures that I showed you in the first part, is now saying Paul's writings are scripture. God breathed. They saw the evidence. It wasn't that they authorized the 12th man. They recognized the 12th disciple, and they see it in them. What is my point for us this morning? It's simply this. You and I have decisions to make, and we will until he calls us home. When it comes time for a decision, how about let's trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. What do you think, huh? Maybe we can pause and begin to pray for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding because that's what James taught us. The brother of Jesus says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask, ask. 
And you know what happens when we ask? He says, come together because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, my word is confirmed. Why do we so often leave these um, prayer team people on the sides alone? Why do we leave these elders here alone as they're standing there to come in agreement with you, to help you understand the discernment? Are you still trying to manipulate things and putting parameters around God? Because God is limitless, but we limit him. Mm -hmm. And you see, today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the day the entire crowd was saying, Hosanna, 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 which means save now, save now, save now. There was such a euphoria of the Messiah to come and deliver them from their problems. But when that Messiah started looking different, you see what happened when the cheering stopped. When the cheering stopped, and he started forgiving and started flipping tables and started doing things that didn't look according to their plan, this same crowd who said, Hosanna, yells, crucify, crucify, because the key to frustration is unmet expectation. Amen. Wow. But you know what Jesus did for that crowd? He died on a cross for them because Peter needed to be forgiven. If Judas had have only hung around, he would have been forgiven. And you and I needed to be forgiven. And so God, while we were yet sinners, died on a cross so that you and I can live beyond what we think is unforgivable. Amen. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you got to ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and today I come home. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says. Because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.